It's been a great week and a good morning thus far. Uh, before we open God's Word, got a question for you. What is a foot long and slippery? A slipper. It's true. Thank you, Bill. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for a wonderful week. We thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, host a vacation Bible school to, to teach and instill the truth that no matter what we face, uh, you are indeed with us, that you are faithful, that your mercies are good and new every morning. Uh, we uh, are grateful, God, for your abiding presence with us. We thank you, Lord, for the, the length that you were willing to go to be with us because our sin, our own disobedience, our rebellion created a great chasm between us and you, a holy and righteous God. And we are grateful, God, this morning that you sent your son, Jesus, who perfectly lived a human life, fulfilled every law, everything that is required to be righteous and holy in your sight, and he died a substitutionary death on the cross to pay for our sins. He received the punishment that is due us so that we, by faith in him, might gain everlasting life and might gain a right relationship with you. So, Lord, we pray that as we look at your word this morning, as we reaffirm what your word tells us about you being with us, help us also remember that that being with us came at a great price. And it is a demonstration of the great love that you have for us and that we indeed owe you everything. So we want to thank you in advance of even looking at your word for what you have done for us through your son Jesus. And we thank you, God, for the gift of salvation and your presence. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been doing a series entitled The Red Sea Rules. The context is uh, Exodus chapter 14 where uh, Moses has led the people of Israel out of the bondage of slavery and he, he has led them right up to the edge of the Red Sea and now Pharaoh's army is behind them. The sea is in front of them. Mountains are on each side of them and uh, they are in need of God's great intervention. We've been looking at these rules kind of like uh, principles to apply to our own life when we're, uh, when we're in a challenging position in life, when we're uh, facing a hard time, when it seems like there's a sea in front of us and an army behind us. And just as a matter of review before we read the scripture for this morning, let me, uh, let me remind us of the rules that we've gone over so far. Number one, realize that God means for you to be where you are. What you're going through, God has a plan and a purpose for every day of your life, and he, he, he means for you to be there. Number two, be more concerned about God's glory than your relief. We need to oftentimes step back and we need to take a look and realize there's, there's more involved and there's something much greater than just our immediate uh, relief. Uh, third, we need to acknowledge uh, our enemy but keep our eyes on the Lord. The devil is definitely in opposition of us, but uh, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And he's been defeated through the Lord Jesus. Fourth, we need to pray. We need to call out to God. We need to depend upon him. Fifth, we need to stay calm and confident and give time for God to work. That's a hard one for Americans because we want everything yesterday. And we need to give God time to work in the situation in which we're in. 
And last week we looked at uh, when you're unsure, you take the next logical step. God told uh, Moses to say, tell the people to move forward. He had parted the sea and they were still standing there. And we need to move forward. And uh, today we're going to look at uh, envision God's enveloping presence. Envision God's enveloping presence. Exodus 14, verses 19 and 20, it reads, Then the angel of God who was going before the hosts of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud moved from before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. So here we have a picture of what happens. At this point, uh, this this, this cloud, this pillar of uh, uh, cloud by day and fire by night, that's been leading the, uh, the Israelites, it moves from in front of them to behind them so that it's between them and the Egyptian army to keep them separated from one another. First thing I want us to, to notice is we, we need to know that the presence of God is with us. Uh, we need to uh, know that the Lord is there uh, and that he's, he's ever-present. The passage starts with the angel of God who was going before the hosts of Israel. Who is the angel of God? Well, if you flip back just uh, uh, the previous chapter in Exodus 13, verse 21, it tells us the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way and by night as a pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So what is this pillar? What is the, the angel of the Lord? It's God himself. Uh, what, we're, what we're witnessing is, uh, is a theophany. Um, this, this pillar of fire is a theophany, a physical manifestation of the living God or a Christophany, a, a, a pre-incarnate demonstration of God's presence with uh, God's people. Um, in this week of Vacation Bible School, as we were studying Daniel's life, when we got to the point in which Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel's three friends were taken, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and put into the fiery furnace, and the story has it that, uh, you know, they... They didn't have any smoke. They, they were not burned in any way. But as King Nebuchadnezzar looked into that furnace, you remember there weren't three. There were four. There were four people. And the king himself said, uh, that fourth one appears as if he is the son of God. That, that's a Christophany. That's a pre-before pre Bethlehem appearance of Christ, of his uh, saving power and, and redemption. Um, so <clears throat> here we have the Israelites. They've got God right there with them, going before them, and now coming around behind them. Um, Isaiah reminds us of that same picture. He says, For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be uh, your rear guard. Um, if you got your beacon, you know that tomorrow we'll be celebrating our 30th wedding anniversary. Makes you reflect some. It seems like it goes by like that. When Melinda and I first got married, whenever we went anywhere, we went side by side, hand in hand, usually. In fact, I remember uh, working with the youth group sometimes, and the kids go, you guys are always holding hands. Um, and then once kids arrived, then, uh, then you start uh, toting a, a, a supplies and pushing strollers and at a certain point in which the kids got at a certain age uh, this is this is what happened I would have Melinda lead and the kids follow and I came in last 
I followed behind. You know why? Because I was watching over them. If I'm in front, I can't see what's going on. But I stay behind so that, in a sense, kind of guard, protect. I could see over all of them. Um, and it was easy to kind of, and, and that's kind of been my pattern since then. Uh, when, uh, when we'd go places, uh, I would, I would uh, get behind. We have a picture here of God who not only leads us, but comes behind us. He's there leading and he's guarding. He's doing both simultaneously. Uh, he's demonstrating his, uh, his, his care for us that comes all around us. I love how David puts it in Psalm 139 when David says, You hem me in um, behind and before and lay your hand upon me. It's like you, 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 you've got me surrounded I'm, I, I'm, I'm protected. I'm, I'm kind of sewn up. Um, and surely Jesus was uh, reminding uh, uh, God's people of who he is and what he did in the life of Israel uh, when he said, I am the light of the world and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. You and I read that and we think, well, that's a great promise that Jesus gives us. But when Jesus said it to Jews, you are the li- I am the light of the world, and if you follow after me, you will not walk in darkness. They very quickly could have gone, I remember a time in which our forefathers walked uh, following a light in the darkness. Uh, he, he's, he's testifying, he's, he's declaring, I'm the God who led my people uh, to the promised land. You see, when you think about who the Lord Jesus is, you, uh, you can remember Jesus is our guard and our guide. He's both before and behind. He's our shepherd and our shield. He is our Alpha and Omega the first and the last. Again, the psalm writer gives us a picture of God being around us by uh, referring to uh, uh, the city of David when he says, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. That, that, That mountain around the city made it safer, made it like a fortress, and God is declaring, I'm that fortress for you, my people. And one of our Bible verses from Vacation Bible School uh, this week, Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Now, from time to time, I seem to be uh, mentioning to you how God shows up, and um, this is another case where I set this series uh, up quite a while ago, never looking at exactly what week would be each thing, but we had a week of vacation Bible school in which the theme every day is God is with you. And this is the Sunday of the conclusion of that week of vacation Bible school. When things change, when you need help, when you're afraid, when you're lonely, when you're thankful, God is with you. We need to know that that is true. But there's a difference between knowing it in our heads and knowing it in our hearts, isn't there? And that's why we need to practice the presence of God. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Practice the presence of God. It means that we, we in our relationship with God, do things, certain things, on a regular basis so that it becomes a natural part of who we are and how we live. If you're an athlete, if you're a a musician, uh, you practice things over and over again so you get that muscle memory so that 
things that were unnatural at one point become so natural that they're second nature to you and you can automatically do them. And that's the way we need to approach our relationship with God as well. We need to practice his presence. And one of the ways in which we practice his presence is to affirm his nearness to you. In other words, remind yourself, drill into your brain these truths that uh, you need to hold on to. Don't wait until you're in a crisis to suddenly go, "Ah, I need to get close to God. No, be close to God all the time so that when the crisis comes, you're all ready for it. You're, You're already close and you already sense his presence. It's not like some urgency now. Uh, I, I, I need him to, uh, to be near me. No, I've already been near him. Um, so you, you practice and review. You remind yourself of truth. Because if you do not review, you forget. Are you with me? Do you believe that? Because it's true about everything. I'll, uh, I'll confess to you uh, uh, this morning, you know, there are things that I find, because I don't use them all the time, that I have a tendency to forget. And one of them is uh, math. Seriously. I mean, math. Uh, because, you know, as a pastor, I'm not doing math calculations all the time. So, and I... I refuse to be one of those people who depends upon a calculator or his phone to do things. So from time to time, I will, I'll do multiplication tables in my head. I always want to do the math in my head at a store. It's 30% off. Well, I need to do that. I need to discipline my brain so that I do that. In the same way, you and I need to practice, we need to review, we need to remind ourselves of what is true about being in a relationship with God and being near to him. The Apostle Paul in Philippians, a letter he wrote while he was in prison, wrote, The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. When you feel anxiety welling up within you, what do you need to do? Remind yourself, the Lord is near. I don't have to sweat it. In Isaiah, Isaiah writes uh, on behalf of God, Fear not, for I am with you. You don't have to be afraid. I am there for you. In Genesis, uh, we're told, behold, I am with you and I will keep you wherever you go. He's not limited by geography in any sense of the term. And in Acts it tells us, speak and do not keep silent for I am with you. Be faithful, speak up, be a witness for me. And in Hebrews, we read, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. The devil would love for you to believe that, that you'll be left, that you'll be forsaken. And God declares, I won't do that. So you review, you remind yourself, you reaffirm. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe that he's trustworthy? See, if you believe that he loves you and he's trustworthy, then you can take the promises from his word and go to the bank. You, 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 can, you can stake your life on his promises. So you reaffirm over and over again what is true. Second thing, and is uh, you visualize God's presence in your mind. Now this, I'll tell you, I only learned uh, really this practice a few years ago, but, you know, we do need to read the scriptures in the context in which they're written, understand who the author was writing to and the audience, 
But we also need to remember that this is not just a historical book or a factual book, but this is a book of transformation. And when we take it to heart, when we take the truth of God's word to our heart, it will move us and change us and transform us more and more into the image of God's own son. So, so you visualize what the scriptures are saying. Let me give you a few examples. Deuteronomy says, the eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. I believe it was Dorothy who said, there is no place like home. Click, click. Right? But you know, Dorothy's not the only one that says there's no place like home. If you travel a little bit at all, um, I know I've, I've said this before, oh, it's so nice to be back home. You don't sleep as well as when you sleep in your own bed, right? There's something about being at home, and in the context of being at home, you just feel like, ah, oh, I can relax. I, I'm where I belong. Now, can you visualize that and go, God is my home. I am at home when I am with God the Lord God. And you know, uh, the most important thing in any house is what? Builders? What's the most important thing in a house? The foundation, absolutely. If the foundation is no good, the house isn't going to last. And God's word says, he's your dwelling place, and guess what? His everlasting alarms are underneath you. Now, that's, that's a firm foundation, isn't it? What about what David said? David, uh, a shepherd boy who became a king, uh, declared about the Lord God, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When God in his scriptures identifies us as sheep, you know that's not a compliment, don't you? Lambs are cute, but we own sheep for a while, and I'm telling you, they are not terribly intelligent animals. They need a lot of tending to. Um, and uh, they, they are the one animal that actually literally requires human intervention. They need their wool sheared. They, they, they need us to do things for them. And they're terribly nearsighted. So that's why you can see, you can see a flock of sheep out in a, in a pasture field munching away and just having a good old time. And then suddenly they all run and take off like their life depends on it. And you see out there, there's just a rabbit hopping down. Because they can't see very well. And so they're real skittish and they run from about anything. But they have pretty good hearing. And Jesus identified himself as the good shepherd. And he said, my sheep know my voice. And I, I witnessed that when I was in Israel, when we were, uh, our, our bus stopped just outside of, of Bethlehem, and the, the, uh, our tour guide said, now watch this. The shepherds are getting ready to let the sheep out of a corral, and they had a big stone wall corral, and they pulled the gate open, and there were three shepherds, and they fanned off in different directions, and they started calling. And there were three different flocks in there, and they just went out, and they split off to follow their own individual shepherd. Well, what's the point for you and me? Um, we need to visualize and understand the Lord is our shepherd. He'll, he'll take care of our needs, our wants. But we need to stay within hearing range, don't we? We, we need to be there near enough that we can hear his call and respond to him. In Timothy, the Apostle Paul, uh, also uh, just a way in which we can visualize God's presence in your mind, the Apostle Paul wrote, 
At my first offense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Paul remembers the time in which all his friends forsook him. He, he, he was all alone. Uh, but he declares, but I wasn't alone because the Lord stood beside me. The Lord was there with me. Do you know, even in the best of times, uh, the most earnest of people can't always be with us in every situation. As I read this passage and I thought how God is always with us, I thought of two events uh, in the life of my family. One was Emily was seven years old, had to have her tonsils taken out. And I can tell you that um, when that little girl was being wheeled back and we couldn't go beyond this door, it was very hard for me because I didn't like the fact that I could not see what was going to be going on. And we prayed before, and I can assure you I prayed again, Lord, you're with her because I can't be with her at this moment. I also remember at my mom's passing as the cancer uh, was taking, ravaging her and taking her life um, day by day, moment by moment. There was a certain point in which uh, I remember uh, thinking to myself, uh, Mom, we can't go any farther with you on this journey. We, we, we walk with you to a certain point, but the Lord Jesus walks with you from this point on and entrusting her to him. The Lord is with us through things that nobody else can be with us in. So you visualize that. You visualize and remember that he's with you. You also access God's nearness through prayer. In uh, James, James simply uh, says, uh, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The Lord is just one prayer away. You, 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 you know, I, I, I love some of these uh, insurance, some different things that say, uh, you know, we're available to, to call 24-7. Have you ever had to call them 24-7? Prepare to listen to some music, I'm telling you. You're going to be on hold. You're going to wait. But the Lord is accessible to us. He is as near as yourself. He's, he's there for you. And all we need to do is pray and call upon him. That's what it tells us in Deuteronomy. For what great nation is there that has a God so near that as the Lord our God is with us, whenever we call upon him, he is there. There's a little gospel song. Um, I really like the chorus of it. Uh, where it says, now let us have a little talk with Jesus. Let us tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faint cry, and he will answer by and by. When you feel the little prayer wheel turning, and you know a little fire is burning, will you find, then you will find a little talk with Jesus. Makes it right. We just need to come to the Lord. We need to access him through prayer. D.L. Moody, that great evangelist, uh, was once asked how he could remain so close to Christ uh, throughout his life once he was converted. And his response was this. He said, there isn't any problem in my life that isn't any uncertainty in my work, 
but that I turn and I speak to him as naturally as someone in the same room, and I have done it these years because I can trust Jesus. I can just picture D.L. Moody. He's confounded with a problem, and he doesn't know what to do, and he goes, Jesus, I don't know what to do about this. You know, he's, he's given a choice. Lord, I don't know which choice to make. He just talked to the Lord as if the Lord were right in the room with him. There's a chair in our living room where I meet with God. There's nothing magical about that chair at all. Nothing supernatural about it. But it is a place in the morning where I go and I meet with God. And when I pray, I do pray as if Jesus is right there because he is. All we need to do is come to him and trust ourselves to him. And that can happen anywhere. But, but we need to make that a practice of ours so that when that crisis comes, it's not a, oh, no, what do I do? It's a, I already know what to do. I just talked to the Lord about this. And then lastly, we practice the presence of God's nearness with us when you and I reflect his presence in your demeanor. In other words, God becomes so much a part of your life that God is seen in you. That, that your reactions to things become more Christ-like. And uh, Jesus already uh, had told uh, the people that he's the light of the world. And you know what? He tells his disciples and therefore tells us as well, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. See, he's the light of the world, but he says, so are you. How can you and I do that? By having Jesus in us. And that's the light of Jesus that goes forth. We're not the source of the light. We're re the reflectors of the light, of who he is. And so uh, our, our reflection of him then uh, is, is a part of his working in us. I'll close with this story about Nicholas Herman. Nicholas Herman was born in 1605 in France. Uh, by the time he reached his teen years, uh, the 30-year war had started, and he fought for the French army. Uh, he was seriously wounded, and from that point on, he walked with great difficulty the rest of his life. He converted and became a believer in Jesus Christ when he was 18 years old, and uh, after the war, he became an assistant to the local official of the French treasury. And he did quite well in his life. And at age 50, he determined that he uh, wanted to deepen his relationship with God. And so uh, he entered into a monastery in Paris. And he was assigned the kitchen. His task uh, was to, uh, to cook and clean uh, for all those in the monastery. And uh, he, he found the job kind of insulting and humbling at the same time. And so for several years, he did those chores in the kitchen uh, grudgingly but dutifully until at a certain point he started thinking and he changed the way he thought about what he was doing because he thought, God is with me and he's with me in this kitchen and I need to honor him in all that I do and just give it to him and live in his presence. 
and he's just started practicing that kind of living in God's presence in the kitchen of a monastery. And it affected how he acted so much that men started coming and seeking his counsel. He's basically the kitchen help. But they started seeking his counsel. Not just the men in that monastery, but he became uh, known amongst others. And uh, one of the leaders of another monastery came and talked to him and had a number of meetings with him, and they started corresponding by letters. And this man kept meticulous notes about everything that Nicholas told him. And he wrote a book about how to live in the presence of God, which uh, was published in the mid-1600s and is still today considered a classic of Christian books. It's entitled The Practice of the Presence of God, and it's, it's noted the author is referred to as Brother Lawrence, which was Nicholas's name in the monastery. Nicholas didn't write the book, but Nicholas was the source of the book by his attitude of how he lived in the presence of God, cooking and cleaning for the brothers and the monastery. I don't know what you're facing today. Maybe it's the drudgery of some things in your life. Maybe there's a crisis. Maybe you're going through a hard time. Maybe you are at the edge of the sea and you feel like the army's behind you. But I can assure you of this. God is with you. He is with you. He will not forsake you. And if you have any doubt whatsoever, you visualize the cross and you remember what he did and how he declares you're worthy even when you don't feel like it. That's how much he wants to be in your life. He's accessible. You and I just need to open up our lives to him. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the reminder that no matter what we face in life on any given day, that you are with us that you would never leave us nor forsake us. Help us as followers of Jesus Christ to practice your presence, to drill within our minds and our hearts the truth of the promises in your word that you are there. Help us to visualize your presence with us in our minds and live within the reality that you are with us at every moment. Lord, help us to be people of prayer who access your presence on a regular basis. And help us, Lord, to so live in your presence that you might be seen in us and that we might reflect you in how we deal with things in life. And Lord, I pray for any this morning who don't have that relationship with you. I pray that they would turn from uh, their sins and entrust their life to you. That they would profess their faith in Jesus Christ who gave his life for us to guarantee for us the promised land, heaven. And to make his abiding presence with us available each and every day to both guide and and guard us. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us and will continue to do for us as we walk in your way and live in your presence. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
our hymn of invitation is I surrender all and the truth is when we wave the white flag and we say I surrender to God uh, we become the winners um, as we stand and sing this uh, hymn I want to invite you if God is calling you to uh, trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior he calls us to publicly profess him because he publicly died for us so I would encourage you to come and to make that commitment. You're among friends. Maybe God's calling you to rededicate your life. Maybe the Lord is calling you to join this church family. Maybe you just want prayer for a, a need you're going through right now. Feel free to come as we stand and sing, I Surrender All.